We are here for 1.8 graphical representation of summary statistics. That sounds really bad, but it's actually a really good section. You'll like this one, okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. I think it's a pretty easy section. Agreed. Um, so we're gonna start just as a reminder that um, when you're looking at a graph, you uh, <laughs> you can determine its shape by its tail and also to tell you or to remind you that the mean is going to follow that tail. So if you are told that the graph is skewed left, then the mean is going to follow the tail to the left. That's the left, right? That's, no, wait, that's, yeah, whatever. <laughs> There's a reason. Skewed right, it'll follow to the right, and the mean will be to the right of the median. And then if it's symmetric, they're all about the same. And that was the old grandma story. Yes. Or I, we'll see about that. Who knows? <laughs> uh, will be now. <laughs> okay. So yesterday, yesterday, last video. You watched the last video. Um, the last video, we talked about minimum, maximum, Q1, median, and Q3. And I told you that's actually called the five number summary. And that five number summary is used to make a box and whisker plot. Now you've yeah. seen a box and whisker plot before. Uh, we're gonna do a little bit of additional information. <laughs> I like all your visuals today, Mr. Bobby. Oh, I'm all about the visuals today. Um, <laughs> something when you can't go anywhere. Add a little bit. If, yeah. When you're looking at the minimum of a set of data, we might not call that the minimum, which is crazy, I know, but the minimum could be an outlier and the maximum could be an outlier. So we actually kind of remove those from the box and whisker plot and the whisker minimum and maximum um, would come in. Okay. This before in middle school, you didn't really work concern yourself with outliers. Right. We take, the reason we identify them as outliers is they're the ones that are so strange that we kind of put them aside. Right. Um, and then when you're building your box and whisker plot, after you determine any outliers and minimums, um, then you're looking at Q1, the median, and Q3 to build the box. And then the second whisker goes all the way out to the maximum unless there's an outlier, and then you're gonna stop at the, the last data point before the outlier. We're gonna look at that though. All right. One more thing, you can determine if data is left skewed, right skewed, or symmetric by looking at the whiskers and the placement of the median within the box. Mr. Bobby, you wanna explain this? So if there's a longer tail to one side or the other, that's a representation of it being skewed towards that direction. So in the top one she's got going there that says left skewed, you notice the whisker on the left side of the uh, box was plot is longer. So that's an indication. That's how you can tell. Yeah. All right. So real quick so that you can refer back to it. I'm not going to walk you through it, but this is how you build the box and whisker plot by hand. Okay, so yesterday we looked at this set of data. If you'll remember, I keep saying yesterday, like you watched it yesterday, but- We know what you mean, we know what you mean. The last lesson, we looked at this set of data that was African-American population um, and the former Confederate States and the state itself versus the prison system. And so we, this is just me copy and pasting this slide from that lesson so that you will remember that your five numbers were um, two is your minimum, Q1 is 15, median is 20.5, Q3 is 30, and your maximum is 37. So I hope in your mind you're kind of picturing how would I build this box and whisker plot. It would look something like this. Now, there were no outliers according to standard deviation in this one, but remember that had to do with means and we're on to medians now. So we've got this whisker and then this part of the box. And remember we talked about, we do this to create quartiles. 
And so 25% of the data is going to fall along this whisker. 25% will fall in the first half of the box. I shouldn't say half, the first portion of the box. The second portion of the box will be the third 25% and the last 25% of the data will be in that last whisker. And a lot, of, a lot of people confuse this. The fact that there are different widths for each of those quarter, each of those points doesn't mean there's more data in each of them. They're the same amount of points in each of those pieces. It's just more densely packed in this case between 20 and 16 or whatever that first part of the box is. So now if you were asked to describe the population distribution, what did we use in, in order to describe a population distribution? Do you remember, Mr. Mother? I don't know, we said some bad words. Yeah, we talk about cuss and BS. So we start with the center. When we're looking at a box and whisker plot, the center will of course be a median. Um, I'm sorry, I'm sidetracked because the puppy just climbed in the crate with the pug. Um, so keep talking, Mr. Bobby, while I fix okay. this nightmare that's about to happen. <laughs> so there's a center at a, about 21, all right? And then we look at the unusual points. And there, we said earlier there were no unusual points. I would begin by, I always want to get my BS or my B specific part in early. So I would have said the mean, or I'm sorry, the median was approximately 21% of the African American population. I know it seems obvious, to, but spit back the topic of the problem always. Okay, that's when you're covered. Okay, because we're gonna we're gonna be never 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 gonna let go of that specific piece because the readers don't don't when they're grading. Um, so I, I address the center. I address the um, unusual. I got my B specific done. Now I need to look at the shape, and I could say I you could say maybe this is skewed to le left because the tail on the left is bigger than the tail on the right. But if you said it was roughly symmetric, you have a little wiggle room to see what you see here. Yeah, it's a little confusing on this one because this, this median bar is pushed over, right? Yeah. So it's a little confusing on this one, but yeah, look at that whisker and how the whisker is longer. Um, so I agree. And then our last S in the cuss is... Um, we, um, and yeah. then spread, I'd have to do the spread. spread yeah, and, and so I spread when we're looking at medians and box and whisker plots would be... The range. The range but more specifically the interquartile range so you can absolutely talk about the range at this point um you really need to discuss also or maybe instead of the um interquartile range because that's usually what we're most interested in is what does the typical data or what do the typical data points look like in the problem mm -hmm. so your answer could sound something like this the median percent of the African-American state population in former Confederate state appear to be approximately 21%. There are no outliers. We suspect the shape of the graph would be roughly skewed left, but it is difficult to determine in this graph. And the middle half of the data varies by about 15%. And that's, that's wonderful. That's Thanks. a wonderful explanation. And if you had a little, you know, you have a little bit of wiggle room, but you definitely don't want to lock in anything that, you know, when you're doing it, use your wishy-washy words. Wishy-washy words. <laughs> okay, so if you're now wondering, we just said there were no outliers, but how do we actually know there are no outliers if we don't have standard deviation in this problem? Because we don't, because standard deviation goes with mean and we just switched everything over to medians. So when you're looking at, um, your outliers for medians, you're gonna use this one and a half rule. So an outlier is a value greater than 1.5 times the interquartile range above or below the, those ends of the boxes, right? Q, below Q1 or above Q3. And but, this actually makes sense to me because when we were doing it for means, we were doing two times the standard deviation from the mean, which is the center. Right. They, now I've got the box itself on either side taking up a little space. So I want to multiply by something a little less than two. So 1.5 is the compromise for median. Yeah. So here's my information for my states. We've already done the summary before. Got all that. 
We have the IQR down here. So what we're gonna do is if we wanna determine if they're outliers, and I don't really suspect that there are, but if I wanted to really confirm that, what I would do is I would begin by finding one and a half times the IQR. The IQR in this case was 15. So one and a half times 15 is 22 and a half. Now what's happening here is from 15, I wanna know is if I go 22 and a half to the left of that, am I gonna have numbers outside of that? Well, I think you can visually see that that's a negative number, 22 less, 22 and a half less than 15. So we're good there, no outliers. And, and likewise, if I'm at 30 and I go 22 and a half above that, I think you can see we're gonna be well above 37. And so if there are no values outside of that range that I just found, that negative seven and a half to 55.5, then there are no outliers. But let's look at the prism. We suspected and determined that six was an outlier from using standard deviation. So let's do that same thing, but this time let's use my IQR. So again, I'm gonna begin by finding one and a half times my IQR, which is 24 in this case. So we wanna go 24 below. I'm gonna go 24 below that Q1, and that's actually only gonna take me to 17. And that well, and six is beyond that, so that confirms that six is indeed still an outlier if we use median. Right. And then now, check the other side. Yeah, I'll check the other side now. So we'll go above this time. So 57 and then uh, 24 more than that takes me to 81. So 66 is well within 81. Uh, and so I'm good. Uh, it, are there any values outside of 17 and 81? Yes, there is one. That's right. It's six, and so I would say 6% is an outlier. When I make my box and whisker plot, my wi where is my whisker gonna go to? Because it can no longer go to six, so where does my whisker stop? Your whisker actually goes up to and stops at 28. So what your five number summary was from before, before we clear clarified this definition, your min actually would be 28. Right, and so this actually is gonna change now let me see if I can grab my pen. This minimum is actually gonna change now and become 28. And now I would need to say, okay, I have an outlier. Uh, I'm gonna be lazy, out L at six, right? And my graph will now depict that shortened whisker and that outlier out to the side. So let me see here, let me clear that and then Go back to my mouse, and here's my graph. And you can see with the exception of New Mexico that now the graph is more, seems to be more symmetric. Right. If we discount that because of what we saw in the video perhaps, or just because it's not, we didn't think it was really a Confederate state. Right, and now pause the video and describe the population distribution, and we'll go ahead and we'll throw the answer up and you can kind of check to see where you're at. Pause. <laughs> okay, so let's go ahead and check now. So we have a median percent of the African American prison population in former Confederate states um, at about forty-seven percent. Remember to use about or approximately. Um, oh, no, I said forty-eight. I, when I wrote it down, what I wrote down during the pause, I wrote forty-eight. Forty-eight is fine as long as you put about or approximately in front of that number. Okay, because I want to make sure I get an A. <laughs> me too. Me too. Okay. Uh, it says there's an outlier at 6%. You can see it. We suspect the shape of the graph is roughly skewed left. Notice that left whisker is a little tiny bit longer, but it is difficult to determine from this graph. Again, it almost looks symmetric to me. Like at this point, you probably could have said symmetric, except where you got that outlier really pulling everything over. So be careful with that. Um, and then the middle half of the data varies by about 16%. So I hope you did well. I did. Good. Once now, what if, but that's okay. what if we stack them? Oops, I didn't mean to throw that on there. 
What if I ask you to now compare the distributions? So go ahead and pause the video. We practiced this a couple of times. Make sure you use your comparison words. Okay, so let's go ahead and check to see how you did. Ms. Robbie, you wanna read this time? So we have the median percent of African-American prison population in federal states appeared approximately 28% larger than the median of the state population. And that shows an overrepresentation of African-Americans in being incarcerated. Now I'm gonna get, I'm, I wanna make a conclusion. And I, wanna, I wanna say something here. I wanna maybe, you know, protest or something, but how, I can't yet. We, I'm beginning to make, I'm beginning to look at this and I want to see something. I, I could read the rest. There's an outlier at six and the shapes are roughly symmetric, blah, blah, blah. And also about the middle, y'all can read. But the real crux of the matter is now that we're comparing these, can I make a conclusion? Do I have enough statistical evidence? And the answer to that at this point is actually no. Just because I see it and I'm getting emotional, or maybe I'm getting emotional, maybe not. I don't know what you, I don't want you to, again, we said we're not going to really try to get political here. But the point is, this graph leads me to want to make a conclusion, but I don't have the formal process yet statistically. And unfortunately, this is what, at this point, too many people make too many strong decisions without actually going through a statistical method. And that's the whole point of this course. So I really kind of want to pause here. You, you don't know how to do this yet. You're not, we're not there yet, but that's where we're going to go. We're going to look at the data and we're going to look at this number and we're going to develop a process, a statistical process where we can come to a rare, very pretty sound conclusion that there is a difference between these two. There may be, there may not be. I, but I can't make that decision just yet just based on this. Yeah. Well said. Thank you. Okay, in case you're curious, because it is really hard for some people to look at the box and whisker plots at first and really pull information off of it, I wanted you to see what the histograms look like. Um, see how that outlier really made this skew to the left obvious. Whereas this one didn't have an outlier, so the skew to the left is, it's there, but it's not, like it's not super significant. Um, so is there anything else that you want to add here about the just, comparison? Yeah, it's still that comparison. You don't jump to conclusions. Yeah. Just... yeah. Um, one more thing. One thing that a box and whisker plot does not do for us is it doesn't tell us anything about how many peaks a graph has. So for example, this is the um, duration in minutes of 220 eruptions of the Old Faithful Geyser, which is bimodal because it erupts uh, twice a day, I think, in the morning and in the evening, I think. I can't remember. But anyways, it's bimodal because it's got two peaks to it. But look at if we take that same exact data and we put it into a box and whisker plot, I can tell nothing about the fact that it is bimodal. And I swear you're lying to me. I swear these aren't the same graph representing. They, they are. I actually do believe you. But <laughs> they don't look like they're the same. Because I mean, like those, those can't be the same. Those don't tell me that. They, so the yeah. the form of the graph you choose is so super super important. Yeah. And it's often important to look at multiples to f find different attributes, exactly right. different attributes of the data. Like, what are we trying to get? What point are we trying to get across? Look at multiple visual representations of your data and use the appropriate visual representation to help get your point across. Okay, it's frappy time. This is our very first frappy. Um, so frappy stands for free response, AB problem. <gasps> yeah. And flamingos are the universal, um, mascot of yeah on your book there's a flamingo and the, there are flamingos actually named frappy stat statisticians mentioned i think mentioned my wife is a teacher don't cut the flamingo's head off um is a statistics teacher as well and she has probably over 200 300 flamingos in her classroom crazy um, she crazy. really loves statistics way yeah. more than she is a, the boss she is oh. all right so anyway, when we, and that I know you're probably not as super excited about doing the free response questions from the AP exam, 
but ultimately our goal is to prepare you for that AP exam. And I think many of you do want to earn your credit and get your college credit. If you're going through all these videos and watching us act stupid, um, there's probably a reason, okay? Okay, so now, pause the, you haven't paused it yet. No, don't pause it yet. I'm paused it. If you paused it, like now, wait. Listen to your instructions first. <laughs> <laughs> so, read the prompt. Answer part A. Don't Google it. Don't do anything. Just to the best of your ability, answer part A, and we're going to come back together and discuss part A. Now, pause. Oh my God, you did such a good job. I'm so proud of you. You know, these kids actually, if they don't pause them and do that, they're going to think we're the stupidest people in the world. <laughs> they, they think that without pausing. It's yeah, okay. That's probably true already. They probably figured that out. Okay, folks, we got two different gas additives and one, um, it, yeah, they're going to try to improve the fuel economy. You can you write it. Um, so your graph should have looked like this. Now, if you didn't figure out the outliers, Shame on you, because that's the whole point, one of the whole points of this lesson. I assumed you probably could have made a box plot before this lesson. But what's different is the, our, we've added in that official definition and want you to consider those outliers, which you, of which you had three for additive A. Right. So really quick, um, when you determine your one and a half times your IQR, you were looking at the numbers between negative three and a half and eight and a half. And you're, if you're confused about where those outliers came from, negative three and a half, well, is falling right here. And these are values below Q1. So negative 10, uh, negative 10 and negative eight would both be outliers because they would be beyond that negative three and a half that we determined. And then the eight and a half, this is values above. So eight and a half falls here. So you've got one more additional value in nine beyond that uh, value. And negative numbers are okay here because the, this time in this problem, the additive actually made the fuel economy worse. Right, okay. sadly. So yeah. Economy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, okay. So if you did not have a perfect paper, we're gonna talk about scoring in just a minute, but if you have not, did not have a perfect paper, go ahead and make some changes now that you need to make because you're gonna need your graph and your information to answer the next part of this question. So now would be a great time to pause. Okay. okay, so now you're pausing again and you're gonna go ahead and you're gonna answer part B, read and think. This question is a lot harder. So really think about what your graphs mean and how that plays into the two questions that are being asked. Pause. Okay, that's for the pause. And I guess I'll do the countdown. You don't see this, but before we start the video, we always do a countdown, so. <laughs> you I'll wanna explain this one, Mr. Bobby? I'm gonna get one. I'm gonna get me a clacker. Okay, explain. Your turn. Okay, my turn. So what we're looking for is the proportion. If we were more concerned about increasing the fuel economy for the greatest proportion of cars, we would choose additive A. And the reason for that is the entire box and the whisker on the right is greater than zero. So that at least 75% of the cars, even a little more because part of this, the low whisker is above zero. So looking at that, I can tell that each of those uh, pieces of the graph represent 25%. So I know at least 75% of the cars experienced an increase in fuel economy if at, I wanted additive A. Now, if I wanted to worry about increasing the mean average, or the mean of the gas mileage, I would use additive B because I have some really big numbers in additive B. And that graph is skewed to the right, which pulls the mean to larger numbers. And we're doing it backwards because we got the video thing, but the, the additive B is going out to the right and that will pull the mean higher. Right, right. and that's kind of why we mentioned at the beginning of this that the mean will follow the skew. That was important, that was a hint. <laughs> okay, so really quick, we're gonna go to the scoring and at this point, this is probably not your first AP class. If it is, then this isn't gonna be weird for you. If it is your first AP class, this is gonna be the weirdest scoring you've ever seen. Yeah, and AP statistics scoring is weird, 
period. Well, that's uh, what I mean, is AP uh, statistics. Where are the others? I grade for AP calculus. I just count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. They're, these stats people, they're weird. Okay, so first page of the scoring guide when, because at some point you're probably going to have to look one of these up, is just telling you, sorry, first page of the scoring guide is just telling you what were the answers. And it may go on to the second page, but that's the first part. It'll say solution. Then after that, it's going to say scoring. Now, scoring is based on letters. <laughs> letters. <laughs> Numbers. Okay. So like, yeah, when I grade for AP calculus, I just count. I literally count. It's easy. One, two, three, four, five. Right. See, I have to do E, P, or I. And I'm going to let you explain E, P, and I. Actually, what you... Yell at Tracy and get Tracy in here. Let's get her. She's an AP grader. She'd be I'm great to explain it. An AP grader as well. Tracy, yeah. do you mind joining us for a second? Oh, oh. yes. This so is Mr. Bobby's wife actually grades the AP test for College Board at the end of the year. So she would be a really great person to explain the three levels of correctness. And we might actually have one of our night sessions oh, later gosh. on this year. So this is my <laughs> wife, Tracy. Hey. What am I here for? So we just answered our first frappy. Okay. And we just pulled up the scoring rubric and it's the very first time they're ever seeing an AP statistics scoring rubric. And we thought since you're your brilliant self, you might explain to them essentially correct, partially correct and incorrect. Okay. Um, so the essentially correct is the E obviously and they are looking for particular items in your responses. And if you have all of those items, then you're gonna get an E. It does not mean you have to have a perfect response. That's why they call it essentially correct, yes. <laughs> but you have all the major requirements for the response. And in all the rubrics, they list out specifically what those are. Now the P, if you are missing something, but you still have enough that they're like, yeah, you're, this is not bad. You're just missing this one or two things that we really wanted to see. Then you're going to get a P, which is partially correct. And so to, then the rubric really spells out each of them, what they mean by partially correct. It's usually, all right, you messed this one part up that we were looking for and we're okay. Or you didn't quite word this clear enough. So you kind of lower down to a P. And then there's the, hopefully you will never get it, the I, the incorrect. You may have done one thing right or two, but it wasn't enough to show that you really have a true understanding of statistics. And so they'll give you an incorrect or you got enough wrong that we're like, eh, no, we're not so happy. Okay, so <laughs> you wanna go through the one, two, three, or four now? Sure. Yeah, so each part of a problem, you're going to get this E, P, or I. And so I on my, my papers, I write E, P, I. And then I have this series, if it's a three or four part problem, part problem, you have this E, P's, and I's. And so a grade for a question, though, those E, P, I's get turned into a one, two, three, or four. And so for most questions, basically an E is worth one point, a P is half a point, and an I is no points. And I can almost always just add those up and then round up. You do not <laughs> want to be in like halfway range, like yes. two and a half, if you can avoid it, because then guess who gets to make the decision? <laughs> she gets to make a decision. So if you look at this one, like if I just look at the score of a three, that means I got two E's and a P. So point wise, that's like two and a half points. And so they'll round that up to, two, to three points. Now four, of course, is perfect, all E's. And honestly, it's not perfect, remember, it's essentially correct. You showed enough that we're really, really happy and didn't make a big mistake. Even though they're grading their wishy-washy. <laughs> Right. <laughs> and then a two, basically it adds up point-wise to a two or a one and a half. If you 
do the E's one point, P's a half a point, and I's one point, and then there's a one. Now, do we want to talk about holistic grading? That will actually come into play on this question. Yeah. Maybe. So maybe we'll hold well, off, hold on, off on, that. on that for Because there's minutes. another type of grading that you'll run into, and I'll yeah. just I'll we'll leave it away there. from that. Thank one. you very much. <laughs> you want Nikki? By the way, the by the way, that was Nikki. <laughs> okay. So I'm gonna you can pause the video and kind of score yourself and see where you were at. Um, look for, for example, when it switches to partially correct. Look to see if you are missing labels. Look to see if there's some error, small error in the construction of your box plot. Look to see if you just got your outliers wrong. Oh, I was a little big on this one. Yep. Yep. Um, and then incorrect. Now, look, only one of those can be wrong for it to be partially correct. If more than one of these are wrong, if you made a little error on maybe where Q1 is and you missed an outlier, then it becomes incorrect even if everything else is perfect, it still becomes incorrect. And then on the second part, and this is a lot more reading, you feel free to pause it and read all of it. Um, you would have to go through here and, and when we grade these for you, we're gonna use this rubric side by side with what we're looking at and, and decide, you know, did you choose the right one and did you give a good explanation or were you missing some, you know, maybe you didn't talk about the lower quartiles being um, where they were. Maybe your explanation was weak or there could be a lot of reasons. You can see this, tons of reasons why you got a partially or an incorrect response. And, part, and P's are okay because partial, they're partially correct. You do not have to get 100% right. on an AP exam to get a three or a four or a five. Right. Okay, so, um, oh, I need to jump back over to the lesson and wrap up with the um, yep. assignment. There, there. <laughs> There's your puppy, and uh, yeah, you, got one you can see yet in the video, um, she's awful. She's just, yeah, she is that. So. so, I think you'll find that these assignments for this lesson are super easy and quick. So, um, thanks for listening. I hope we were helpful, and we will see you on the flip side. Bye bye. Bye.